Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. God's word is implanted on our hearts. It guides us here to seek God's presence. It calls us into a community of faith to share and serve together. Let us worship Christ, the word of truth, the word that grows in our hearts to the glory of God. Our first hymn this morning is For the Beauty of the Earth. It's number 14 in the Purple Hymnal. Confession and prayer of confession. Let us confess our sins to the loving God who calls us close through our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. God of light, we confess we live in the shadows of hypocrisy and self righteousness. We honor you with our lips, but we have not served you in our hearts. We are satisfied with the way things are and avoid your liberating truth. We have confused meekness with weakness, holiness with polite conformity, and anger with righteousness. Forgive us, we pray, 
by the power of your word, save us from ourselves, that we may serve you with sincere hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. be seated.
Now for our prayer of elimination. God who speaks and brings chaos into order. Holy Spirit whose wind and flame makes us sit up and take notice. Christ who guides us with grace and truth. Implant your word in us this day that we might be open to the awe and wonder of your great love for us and our world. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Listen for God's word to the church. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Uh, sometimes the choir preaches the sermon, and what I do is sort of an appendix or a, I don't know, <laughs> something else. I feel like that was true today. That was an amazing anthem this morning. I, I was certainly going to church uh, listening to that. I wanted to, I, I knew I was forgetting something in the announcements. I want to point out the rosebud and the blanket on our baptismal font. Virginia Ferguson Hull was born this past week to Nancy and Robert Hull and a host of brothers. Um, and so we are, <laughs> we are lifting up prayers of joy and praise to God for that. Um, I think everybody is, is healthy and um, we are excited to meet her and, and get to know her and love her as one of our own as well. Our second scripture reading comes from the letter of James. It's James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. This is God's word to the church. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who Look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. James uh, doesn't write as much as Paul. We've just got this one letter of James, but it's a doozy. James is the southern grandmother of the Bible. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Doesn't that kind of sound like James? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. I once worked with someone who was quick to respond, quick to anger. It never went well. He'd get an email or a message or have an encounter which started to really heat him up and he would dash off a quick email that would, of course, cause a whole host of other problems. Sometimes he would tell me about a recent offense and what he planned to respond and I soon learned 
that I didn't have to edit his email or try to talk him down. All I had to do was to try to get him to wait. That's a pretty hot email. Why don't you sleep on it and send it tomorrow? Of course, he would never respond after a night of sleep like he initially wanted to. Often he wouldn't respond at all, which was usually the right call. Introducing a little slowness to our anger is rarely the wrong thing to do. I won't say never. Sometimes when you're advocating for someone who needs help, you might need a little anger in the moment. But most of the time, adding slowness to our anger is the right call. The thing is, and I think our grandmothers knew this, words are powerful. Spoken, written, emailed, texted, recorded, words are powerful. Once they are out, (laughs) they can't be put back in. Words can build up, but words can also tear down. Words can hurt and heal. Words can stir the imagination, and they can also shut down an imaginative person. Whoever said sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me must have had a much different middle school and high school experience than most human people. To to say nothing of toxic work environments, superficial judgy comments, church conflict, gossipy friends, all of which have been known to sting us with some harsh, powerful words. James knows how powerful words can be. He spends a whole half of chapter 3 talking about the trouble that mouths and tongues can cause with images of wild horses and raging fires. Words are powerful. The mouth and the tongue can't be ignored. That's why, for one reason, in our time of word saturation, when words come at us from every moment, from every direction, we've found ourselves struggling with what it means to have even freedom of speech. It's an essential freedom to a free society. Yet we've also seen how untrue words coming from influential people can be disastrous. Like the radio host who turned his listeners against the parents of the Newtown school shooting with false insinuations that the shootings were staged or fake. We can't be flippant about our freedom of speech. It's as much a responsibility as it is a right because words are powerful. James understood that the churches trying to live gospel of Jesus Christ were going to have a hard time if they couldn't even control how they talked to and about each other. But if James is worried about our bent toward harsh words, angry words, divisive and confusing words, he has ultimate faith in the transformational power of words, too. Well, actually, not so much words, but word. One word. The implanted word, the word of truth, that is the word who is truth, the way, the truth, and the life. James has ultimate faith in the word that is God's ultimate word, the word that is Christ, implanted in our hearts to overcome our baser instincts that threaten the unity and health of the church and our communities. James believes, and I do too, in the power of the implanted word and the goodness it can bring when we tend to it and allow it to grow in us. And so he says, welcome the implanted word with meekness. There's a family joke we used to have when we'd go to Julie's parents' house. They used to have this coffee mug. I haven't seen it in a while. I don't know if it's still there. But it had the fruits of the Spirit written around the top rim of the coffee mug. And if Julie's dad saw that she was drinking out of it, he would turn it just so, as if to suggest that she should drink out of the meekness side of the cup. (laughs) Of course, Julie would feign insult and anger and spin the cup to some other word, frankly, any other word. 
refusing to drink from the meekness side. The, the joke, of course, is that if you know Julie, she's anything but meek. At least not in the way we think of the word. The truth is, the way we think of meekness isn't really what the Bible means when it says meekness. We tend to think of meek, uh, a meek person as a quiet or shy or mousy, maybe weak, a wimp, a doormat welcoming people to walk on them. And while there is a connotation of humility in the word, it isn't about weakness at all. It's about submitting our wills to God's will. In truth, that takes incredible strength, strength of character and strength of faith, a taming of our own passions so that God's passion for us and for the world can grow and reign in us. It's that meekness, that giving of ourselves over to God's will that really allows the implanted word to grow and flourish and give us its gifts. Martha Morkish, my theology professor, who wrote a, a great new commentary on James, some of you saw I posted it on Facebook, um, she compares the growth of the implanted work, word with that rank growth of wickedness James talks about earlier. She writes, even the most forgetful and haphazard of gardeners know that what James is talking about. Lots of things grow quickly in a garden, and the most enthusiastic plants that appear and multiply and take over are usually weeds. If we do not watch and tend, clearing away what James calls rank growth, then the tomatoes and squash and okra will get choked out. We will never get our gumbo or our squash casserole. The clearing of the weeds can be summed up simply as the clearing out of our own will, our own plans, our own grievances, our own desires, to make room for the implanted word to grow. The scripture says what it grows into is salvation. And so our growth in Christ isn't just a scripture acting on us or a sermon coming at you or a prayer prayed for you, but our growth in discipleship, our growth in Christ, is Christ's growth in us. The renowned spiritual guru and monk, Thomas Merton, writes, In all the situations of life, the will of God comes to us not merely as an external dictate of impersonal law, but above all as an interior invitation of personal love. We must learn to realize that the love of God seeks us in every situation and seeks our good, he says. That interior invitation that is the implanted word, it's above all a love that seeks us out. And if we pay attention to it, can rebuild and renew and repurpose us from the inside out. As Professor Moore Kish says, the word is not external to James. He cannot do something with it, it does something with him. He calls on us to allow the word to take root and grow in us, that our lives are the outworking of its power. And so James calls on us to be, as you heard already, doers of the word, that implanted word. Which to me means that the word that is implanted in you, that word that tells you that you are loved and brings you salvation and calls you to live in truth, to be quick to listen and slow to anger, as that word grows, it doesn't just grow to fill your heart or even your mind but it grows to fill your arms and your hands. It grows to fill your legs and your feet. And this is probably one of the most important things to James. It grows to fill your voice box and your mouth. 
The implanted word doesn't just grow until it's filled our thinking, feeling selves, leaving us with a peaceful smile in our recliners. The implanted word must grow into our doing selves as well. To ultimately turn our eyes and our hands and our mouths toward the benefit of those James calls the widows and orphans, who we would call the most vulnerable, the poverty-stricken, and the love-starved among us. So when I was a kid, I remember an enormous oak tree in a neighbor's yard fell over in a storm. You've seen this happen a hundred times. It was the first time I had seen it. The storm was strong, but not surprisingly strong. At the time, I didn't know that oaks often live about a hundred years, uh, at least in our, that neighborhood. So I was surprised that this big, sturdy, seemingly eternal oak tree would fall over. Even more surprised because outwardly it looked healthy. No dead limbs that I could see, bright green leaves all over. But when I looked inside the upturned trunk, it was rotten and hollow. Where I thought there was a great strong core, there was actually nothing. You couldn't tell from the outside. Until, of course, the tree fell over. So tend the inside. The call to do the word or to be slow to anger or to care for those in need, all of those things will come if we tend to the growth of the implanted word. Let Christ grow within us to strengthen our trunks for the work of discipleship, which can be hard and can be risky, but there is deep joy, faithfulness, peace, and well-being in tending and growing the garden where the implanted word wants to grow. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Now having heard the word, read and proclaimed, let us stand as the community of faith and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed in your bulletin. And we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our second hymn is number 729, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
be seated. As we prepare to turn to God in prayer, our prayer will be like we often do, a, a series of petitions followed by a call in response. Our call is Lord of Light, and your response is hear our prayer. So when I say, I'm sorry, God of Light, you say hear our prayer. God of Light, hear our prayer. In peace, let us pray to God as we say, God of light, hear our prayer. For this church, your church of Jesus Christ, God of light, hear our Bless the church, O God. Deliver us from self-righteousness and make us holy in every way that all people may see you in the witness of us, your faithful servants. For pastors, teachers, and church leaders, God of light, yeah. bless the leaders of your church, O God, and all who minister in your name. Give us the wisdom to discern your truth, to honor your commandments, and to lead with humility, to do what is right, and to speak truth from our heart. For the world and for its leaders, God of light, Bless the nations of the world, O God. Guide the leaders of governments for the sake of peace. Give them sound judgment and merciful hearts, and help them be accountable for the common good. Save them from the cynicism of war. Free them from the influence of greed. Deliver them from the temptations of power. For the communities in which we live, God of light, yeah. bless our communities, O oh God. Help us live as friends with our neighbors and to do good to one another, that homes may be free of fear and families live in peace. For children, God of light, bless children and those who care for them, O oh God. Protect them from harm. Give them what they need to grow in body and mind and provide caring adults to model for them a life of purpose and compassion. For the sick and those in distress, God of light, hear our prayer. Bless, O oh God, all who are ailing in body, mind, or spirit. Heal them of disease and restore them to fullness of life. For those who are judged by others, God of light, Bless those who face the reproach of society, O oh God, for those in prison, for those who are ostracized due to mental disease, for those who are homeless, and those who are bound by addiction. Surround them with compassion and save them from helplessness. These prayers we offer to you, God of light. We lift them up in the name of Jesus Christ, who implants your word in us, and who teaches us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is.
affliction, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are called to grow in discipleship in some ways by giving what we have to give. It may be a financial gift that we put in the plates or we give online. It may be gifts of ourselves, of our time and our energy, of whatever it is in us that Christ is growing. In this moment of giving, let us give what we have to offer to the Lord and to the church. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy Spirit, receive these gifts for the work of your church. With these gifts, we also dedicate ourselves to follow the Lord with sincere hearts. Amen. Our final hymn is in our red songbook. It's number 16, He Leadeth Me.
My battery's dead, I think, <laughs> or it's dying. In any case, our invitation is always twofold. For those who are visiting with us and maybe searching for a church home, we invite you to find a home here with us as we do our best to let God's implanted word grow in us, as we do our best to be God's faithful people here and now. And for those who are members, even longtime members of this church or any church, I invite you to believe that God's word is still growing in you and still finding new ways to spread out in your life, new avenues of faithfulness for you to travel. And if you'd like to talk about what that looks like in your life, I invite you to have a conversation either with me or one of our other church staff or better yet with each other so you can talk together about what God's doing in your lives. In any case, as you go out into the world, go carrying the love of Christ to everyone you meet by word and by deed, and go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.